babies in the business industry, we're babies in content, just starting to try, we've got like 250 followers on Instagram, but we're Better than zero. Better than zero, exactly. So we're, we're starting to grow it. I would just ask maybe what would be some advice that you have for someone who's just starting off? You need to start Googling and YouTubing and podcasting and educate yourself on something I call SOC. Strategic organic content. Not just posting happy fucking Wednesday and hoping it works. Like why are you posting? I need you to understand the thumbnail, the first three seconds, what time you post, how many words, which platform, what's going on on LinkedIn carousels that's different than Facebook carousels, Facebook reels, what are broadcast channels, my social media strategy is not the following. Attention is the number one asset. Super excited to be here. Um, look, anytime I'm in Jersey, uh, it always feels like home. I, uh, I was born in the Soviet Union, uh, but came to America when I was three and, uh, and first lived in Queens. But a couple years in, we moved to Dover. I lived there for a year. And then, uh, and then I moved to Edison, New Jersey in 1982. And that's really where my life began, my entrepreneurial career, my football fandom. Uh, I really wish Eric Godfrey, who was the kid I met outside throwing a football, said to me that he was a Giants fan because I'd have four Super Bowls. Unfortunately, he said he was a Jets fan, I have none. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, look, it's really exciting to be here. I mean, I think it, you know, I, when I do something like this, I think about how do I bring the most value. And so I'd love to do a ton of Q&A um, because I think that's how I can bring the most value to this audience. I think that before I get into that, just to do some kickoff remarks and things of that nature, I really do think the world of business and really life at some level, because ironically, what I'm about to talk about I think really bleeds into pa- parenting and other things. I think the world is very, very much in a place where the two C's have my attention, which is culture uh, and content. You know, so how many people here are business owners? Raise your hands. Um, I know some of you, I recognize some faces. Um, you know, I, I don't think most business owners really actually walk the walk on company culture. And I'm empathetic. Like, if you go out of business, there is no company. So I get the concept of having to make tough decisions and firing people or you know, being stressed, but I, I really believe that for the far majority of the people that just raised their hand who own businesses, if you over-index both on giving a shit about your employees, like actually, you know, which also means like telling, something I struggled with most of my career, telling them the truth when they're not performing instead of just firing them randomly out of left field. Um, if you really focus on culture and understand that retention of your employees always grows your business. There's a lot of costs involved in retraining someone. I know you know that. So in fact, a lot of you know it so well that you're actually holding on to some people that do need to go because you know how hard it is to retrain what that person knows for seven years. So it's a fine balance. But then the thing that clearly led to me being able to sit in front of all of you here today, content. You know, obviously I built a very large liquor store in Springfield, New Jersey for my dad with Wine Library that hopefully some of you have driven by or even stopped into. And at first it was because I was just good at retail in the same way that I was good at selling OJ's rookie cards at a baseball card show. Once I learned, because I knew sports, once I learned wine, I was good at selling all of you wine and I thought I was a salesman. As I got older and I started working in my dad's store when I was 14 years old, stocking shelves every vacation, every weekend, every summer day. And so by the time I was 22 and running the store full time, I was an OG. I had eight years of real work, not like the way kids work today. And so I thought of myself as a salesman. But in hindsight, as I get to sit here today and I'm like, what can I say that will make them do something that will make it good for them? The two things I bet on in my career and everything I've built is innovation and content. So innovation is me launching a website in 1997 for my dad's one store liquor store in Springfield, Milburn. People literally told my dad that like I was going to ruin his business. Not because they were mad at me, because they loved my dad. They, they saw him go from a stock boy who couldn't speak English to owning this store and they've known him for 20 years and here I was coming along and spending $10,000, which was a lot of money for a small business in 1997 to build a website 
everybody told me, kid, you don't get it. This is the liquor business. Nobody's gonna buy wine on the internet. For the youngsters in here, there's plenty of OGs and gray hairs in here, so you'll get it. But for the youngsters in here, a lot of people thought the internet was a fad. A lot of people. And so people were like, open a second liquor store, not this internet thing. And then instead of doing catalogs or running full page ads in the Star Ledger, which I did, but instead of that, I started to send emails in 1997 with wine offering. It wasn't, I wasn't a rocket scientist. Catalogs in the Star Ledger were expensive. Email was free. But in 1997, 98, 99, 2000, and not all of you will remember this if you lived through that era, we were reading like every email. We weren't getting spammed like we are now. <laughs> How many people here have done email marketing close enough to like know it a little bit in your careers? Raise your hand. Perfect. In 1998, I had 100,000 people on the email newsletter with 87% open rates. Now if you're at 30%, you're a genius. But that was because it was new, but it wasn't too new that it wasn't real. The metaverse is coming, it's real. That's gonna impact your business. Events are gonna be in a metaverse, that will happen. But 18 years from today. And so you get to decide like how much that matters to you, what are your ambitions? Retired, so you're like, fuck that shit, I don't care. <laughs> but, but for a lot of youngsters in here, like if, you know, that's gonna change the game. People, back to work from home, trust me, I have 2,000 global employees. I don't think anyone's working, uh, you know. Um, but like, man, work from home, like, Jesus, like, the advancements of the metaverse, we are gonna, ha- like, think about what Zoom meetings feel like now. All of us know that you can, you can be productive. We taught us ourselves that during COVID. When we go into the metaverse and you're getting the things that you lose in Zoom, like, really when it's there in 15 years and it actually feels like you're in the room, you know, not like a video game, but like actually. Like that will change the way we work. So I've always believed in innovation. The thing is, I don't wanna get too far ahead of it. So for instance, I recently helped my dad's uh, liquor store. I innovated, a, luckily six months before COVID, and I created something called winetext.com for him. You get a text every day, like old Groupon, some crazy deal. Like yesterday was a $130 Napa Valley cab for 40 bucks. Because we look at 10,000 wines a year to find 365 good ones, we're getting crazy deals. But it's better, it's like old email. When you get a text and all you have to do is reply with how many bottles you want and it's sent to your home, that's good shopping. Eliminating friction, making it more convenient. Every single business in here, if they make it more convenient for someone to buy, will grow their business. We spend money on time all the time. There are people here who've ordered a $5 burger on Postmates, but it cost you $29 to get it delivered. But the time was worth it for you at this point in your life. Time is always a value play. So innovation, especially when it gives back the consumer time. When everybody was making fun of me in 97, 98, 99, that nobody would buy, I remember one guy, very successful guy, was pushing me hard trying to prove his point and he ended with like, Gary, how many people do you really think in 10 years are gonna buy wine on the internet? And my answer was everyone. And not that I believed everyone, but I believed a lot. And I think many people here know that if you really take yourself back to what you thought you would do versus what you're actually doing, technology always wins. There's plenty of people here who did not want to get an iPhone because they love their Blackberry because they could touch the buttons. (laughs) Nobody here is rocking a fucking Blackberry. (laughs) And so one thing to always think about is innovation, but not so far out that it's not practical. This is not the time to go all in and bet your company on the metaverse. But keep a little eye on it because I could be wrong about 12 years. Apple or Facebook or Netflix or BMW or Google could launch something tomorrow and everything speeds up. This phone, the iPhone was invented and everything changed the next day, right? If you think about the biggest companies in the world, the Facebooks and the Ubers, and right? They don't exist if there wasn't a platform called the mobile device that has the internet on it. So that's innovation. Content is probably the thing that I most wanna leave here inspiring people here to do. 
Whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, in the service business, if you're a VP of sales, if you don't even have your own business, I know as I look at all these faces that everybody, including myself, someone who puts out 50 pieces of content a day across YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, LinkedIn, every person in this room right now, including me, does not post enough on social media if they want to grow their business. And I know most of you don't post at all. And so there is this shocking reality right now in the world where people continue to disrespect social media as a driver to what they want. Whether that is growing your business, whether that is running for local office, whether that is raising money for your local charity or something you care about, the attention of the world is my currency. It's the only thing I care about. You can't get anything done unless you have somebody's attention. Since I was seven on Tingley Lane in Edison, New Jersey and would walk that street to figure out where I should put my lemonade sign to get more people to buy my lemonade to sitting today and looking at everything that's happening on streaming services and social networks. For the last 40 years, all I've paid attention to is where's the attention? Whether that's Direct Mail, Star Ledger, New York Times, Google, Facebook, TikTok, influencers, athletes, sports, where's the attention? Everybody here needs to make a much bigger commitment to understanding where the attention is, not where your attention is. If I hear one more business owner or executive say, well Gary, I don't use TikTok. I go, no shit, Don, but your customer does. Making decisions for your business based on your personal opinions of what people should be doing with their time is one of the stupidest business strategies of all time. You should be 100% agnostic on where you spend your time and money You should care where your customers are, not where you think they should be. And that is a massive mistake I see every day. So look, I think think the world continues to evolve. I don't have to tell everybody in this room. There's a lot going on. Yesterday was the election. It means the 2024 election season has begun, right? So it's gonna be plenty of feelings and all sorts of stuff going on and it is all playing out on your phone. The phone has become the television and the television has become the radio. Got it, Joe? That's what's happened. If you want a history lesson, go look what happened in the 50s and 60s in America, how all the biggest businesses in the world lost market share, and how all the current businesses that are the biggest businesses in the world right now started to grow. And the one variable was the following. Some people held on to running ads on radio, and others jumped into television. Do you know that Amazon was the biggest spender on Google AdWords the first five years of Google AdWords by a 10x multiplier? There's a direct reason why Amazon's one of the biggest companies in the world. They understood where to spend the money on the underpriced attention. So that's kind of where I want to lead the Q&A to like really help you one by one. Are you guys gonna run mics for Q&A? Yeah, I think we have mics right now. We do? Look, I, I'll jump on culture while I get the team set up for mics, but thank you. It's not gonna work. It's always crappy. Um, what I, what I, the other thing I wanna talk about is culture real quick. I just wanna make this point because I think a lot of people in this room might be struggling with this. I, I genuinely do not believe Gen Z is lazy. I, I, I really don't. I think that a lot of us are spending too much time demonizing the up and coming generation about being lazy and entitled, I just need you to hear this for me. Of course, look, I know unlimited people that are lazy in the boomer and Gen X and millennial set too, and entitled. It's not that they're lazy and entitled, it's that they have options. They don't want to work for you for $18 an hour doing dumb shit when they can just post silly videos on TikTok and make $38 an hour. So I'm saying this because I wanna leave here with y'all winning after I leave. Some of you might be, I need to actually be nicer to my employees. Real talk. Some of you it might be, yeah, it's 2024 and everything that's happening in the world is based on social media content. It might be a good idea for me to finally take this serious for my business. For some of you, it might be you stop complaining about these kids don't wanna work and realize why. 
it's because they have options. The average 18 year old kid knows that they can make $50,000 a year on the internet for them pretty easily. And so we have to understand that, we have to adjust. And once you understand that truth and don't just spend your time dwelling or shooting the shit with your other person that's mad about it, and you start attacking of what you're gonna do about it to grow your business, you become accountable to truth instead of trading on ideology. So those are the themes, that's what I'd love to talk about. I'm really appreciative of everybody being here, so thank you for having me. Now I know there's a lot of people here that I've you know, interacted with in the past or know my stuff or have just met me. Like, I, I'm, here to, I'm here to bring value, so be selfish on this Q&A. Ask me whatever you want, make it very narrow. It doesn't have to touch on anything I just talked about. I'm here for overall business Q&A. Yeah, let's wait for the mics so everybody can hear the questions. What's your name, brother? Uh, my name is Kevin. Kevin? Uh, I work for a pharma company, uh, and we kind of developed a unique uh, concept of commercial pharma with franchising. Yep. Um, it's one of a kind, nobody's doing that in the US. Uh, however, there is still the opportunity, as you just mentioned, about attention, where everybody's paying attention and it's the internet, it's the digital world. So, in your sense, you are the franchisor and, you have a fr- and you're looking for franchisees? Yes. Okay, keep going. So the idea is that we still have a lot of people, a lot of business owners and CEOs who have that old school mentality where they don't want to spend too much time and money on the internet and digital stuff. Yes. Uh, how do you still like try to convince them or I guess quote unquote scare them into thinking that hey, if you don't spend the money there, you're not going to get the customers. And even without doing that, we've been able to do it because I had a marketing and business development for it. Uh, however, I do feel like, as you said, like attention is right there, the customer's right there, but we are not spending too much time and money. In your them. model, you're getting a certain percentage from them for marketing. Do they have to kick you three, like most franchisors, do the franchisees have to give you three to five percent for your marketing budget? So we, we try to keep it simple where anything you sell, you get 40%. Of I see, business. I see. Uh, just again, because of the fact that the whole business of pharma Look, I got it. Look, I, and listen, I run an agency and I'm gonna give you my best piece of advice on this. And it's a challenging piece of advice in the seat that you're sitting, but I think when we talk it through for a minute here, you'll understand why, because you, you're gonna know it's true. My friends, the number one issue in the world, politics, religion, uh, business, is everyone's in the business of convincing. Everyone's spending all their time trying to convince everyone else to see it the way they see it, whatever it is. So to your point, you're trying to convince these franchisees to do the right thing, to grow their business. The problem is, it is very hard to convince. So, in our organization, and everything I do for a living as a businessman, I say, don't convince, have conviction. So, instead of spending even one minute trying to convince someone that you already know the second you start talking to them, you know, you're like, fuck, this isn't happening. Spend all your time on you marketing, what you control, to create the case studies for them. I've I've innovated my whole career. When I sell new stuff, I do that all the time. I don't even spend another minute with 98% of the people I talk to or market to because I know there is no convincing. I just look for the 2% that understand what the hell I'm talking about, build, and then let the case. Everybody made fun of me about the internet until they didn't. Everybody made fun of me for doing a wine show on YouTube in 2006 here in Jersey until they did it. Everybody made fun of me for taking my life savings and investing in a company called the Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr until they did it. They laugh at you and then your competitors cry. And so I think you have to be in the conviction business. I don't think you will convince them. I think you have to do good marketing, show them the ROAS, the ROI, the CAC, the LTV of the marketing you do and then just keep feeding them the information of like, you're leaving money on the table and the case studies will always do the work better than you just talking it. Thanks man, thank you. Thank you brother. Yeah, let's clap it up for him. That was a, that was a solid question. Who's got the mic? Yeah, let's double up the mics. Good idea. Oh. Hi. 
What's your name? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lisi, and I um, actually I just completed seven years of business on Saturday. Um, I have a production company, events agency, yep. where we specialize in food and music festivals, and we just started. A friend over here from Atlanta. We just started going into Atlanta. Love it. Um, I saw you at the event. Oh yeah, the 92nd Street, yeah, come 2019. on. Oh, in 19. I just did it the other day on the 92nd, uh, yeah. 92nd Street, why? Yeah. No worries, respect. Um, <laughs> and uh, so at that talk, you were spending time about a lot of conviction about TikTok. Yes. And 2019, everyone, it was, it just, you know, wasn't musically anymore. And yep. It was still, you know, the, the dances and the lip syncing, and no one took it seriously. And you had said something that really stuck out, which was, be where the young kids are, where the tweens are, because then eventually their older siblings get on that and the parents get on it. Facebook was for college it's kids, college. now it's for grandmas. These things age up. It's how they work. Go ahead. So I took that and that day I downloaded TikTok and I started messing around with it and it's very addicting, as many of us probably know now. And I kind of just understood the language of it, which is another thing we talk about, the language of the platform. Slang matters. Yep. And just, or even just the way to communicate, That's the right. authenticity of it, and then the pandemic hit. Yep. And I have already been established on TikTok at that point with my business. And we do food festivals, so you make fun content, I'm promoting local restaurants so that when yep. I'm doing some of the food, you already trust me. Yep. And now my business has really grown. We have, I mean, 65,000 compared to people is a lot, but for a festival. For a B2B event yeah. business, 65,000 is yeah, insane. TikTok, Good for and you. And then TikTok ads came out. Yes. And I found that it wasn't, wasn't killing it on TikTok ads. And okay. I don't know if I don't necessarily understand the ads or if the algorithm is weird. And then this year, Instagram actually started the, like Instagram Reels started being more lucrative for me and also you make the ten dollars a day and yep. it's just going crazy. So now my Instagram is doing really well. We yep. have thirty five thousand. I have one specifically for our Atlanta events. That one is even higher than my Jersey and I've been doing Jersey for seven years. And so I'm wondering my question for you with all that being said is where do you think the next platform is and do you think TikTok advertising is coming up? Have they figured it yep. out? A couple things there. So Every one of these platforms, so I love when people are like, Gary, like inevitably one of you may email me or send me a message after this talk and be like, hey, heard you, but like I did TikTok for six months and it didn't work. And I'm like, cool, I played football in my backyard. It didn't work out the same way it did for OJ. <laughs> like the ROI of a basketball for LeBron James is gonna end up being billions of dollars. For me, like negative 20,000, I have two torn meniscuses. So to your point, you figured out organic TikTok and you were good at it. To your credit, TikTok ads are not as strong converters as Instagram and Facebook because Meta's been around for 15 years and has refined it. Do I believe that TikTok ads work? Yes. Do I believe that's reserved currently for the best 1% of operators on it? Yes. Even us who are the crew, like it ebbs and flows as we refine our capability on it and the platform does. Instagram ads work remarkable because Meta's data on their consumer is bananas. TikTok's algorithm is addicting because it gives you what you want to look at but it doesn't understand you as well. It understands what you like but Facebook like really knows what you bought, like got it? So like you could like some, you could love the Jets or the Giants but you might not be someone who buys football jerseys. Whereas someone else might like it half as much but buys 10 a year. Facebook's better at understanding that than TikTok, hence why converting is different, right? But that ebbs and flows and TikTok will get there. Um, As far as the next one, the reason I have a good reputation is I don't guess. When I told you at that event in 2019 that TikTok was next is because it was TikTok was already it. I'm good at knowing what is it when the world hasn't figured it out yet. I'm just a little faster, it's like sports. People would not, people that don't really understand sports, even like a good fan doesn't understand, just a little more speed can change everything. That's why they run in Indianapolis at the combine. Those point two might actually matter, especially when it's later in the game or this, that, and the other thing. So, same with what I do for a living. I don't need to predict anything. I'm just spending every day watching everything 
and when it's time, when I know it crossed over, it's not a fad, it's not Be Real or Peach or you know, Vine was on its way. Vine was the app that really was the precursor to everything we're seeing now, but it got bought by Twitter so it never got to go, like I'm watching everything, but the second I know I get, I'm, I'm very intellectually generous. The second I know it's there, I tell the world, because nobody's gonna, it's not like some weird secret that you're gonna take from me. There's so much for all of us. Even today, the people that are sitting here, which is, I know the majority that have not gone all in on content on social networks, they may be sitting here feeling like it's too late. What's cool about social media marketing is it's a game of better, not a game of first. I need a lot of you to hear that. Because I feel a lot of you are not jumping in here because like, fuck, I missed that trade. It's a game of better. It's a game of better. Like, I was, on, I was doing TikTok and Musical.ly four years before you heard me say that. You know, and you jumped in and did just fine. So, I don't know what's next, but I spend 24 hours a day paying attention to make sure I do know what's next. What's your take on AI? What's your name, my friend? Uh, Samuel. Samuel, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. What's your take on AI and how that could tie into uh, NFTs? And if NFTs is really still uh, something after uh, the crypto crash? Yeah, so there's a lot there. So, a couple things. Let's jump on the second part first. NFTs, the way all of you know them, if you know them now, is highly speculative digital collectibles, similar to the way internet stocks. Back to why I won the internet, a good thing happened to me. A, I believed in it, and then in 2000, April of 2000, all the internet stocks crashed, and all the mainstream media said the internet's a fad. What they didn't understand was greed kicked in. People valued pets.com and all these internet companies like a billion dollars on Wall Street before they were mature. So they got lost in the micro, not the macro. Beanie babies are not worth a fortune, but do you know how many Squishmallows sold last year? Stuffed animals are good. Got it? People don't get it. It's macro, micro. NFTs. First of all, NFTs are much broader than just digital collectibles and art. Everybody's contracts in the next decade will be an NFT, a non-fungible token sitting on the blockchain because it will be verified and non-manipulatable. And it's better to have your house deed there or your car insurance or your license. Like, everything will be on the blockchain. It's actually gonna become a profoundly big conversation. How many people here by show of hands, don't raise your hand if you don't know, I actually wanna get a sense. How many people in this room know what a deep fake video is? Raise your hand. Great, so about 30%. So I'll go into that in a minute. But to give you the preview, it's some crazy shit. <laughs> the blockchain is gonna be the solve for one of the biggest issues in the world, which is deep fake videos. So anyway, where do I think NFTs are? I think they're exactly where internet was in April of 2000. Everyone here is like, ah, that was a fad, it was a scam, it was garbage. It's one of the biggest technologies in the world. Two years ago, everyone got too caught up in the collectible part, and just like sneakers, and just like trading cards, and just like art, the best 1% of digital collectibles will be something worth collecting and 99% won't. But people don't understand that. They just look at it as the macro, right? Stife bears from Germany from the 30s and 40s are very expensive stuffed animals. Beanie babies aren't. So NFTs are macro. VFriends. VFriends series one NFTs, if I do the right thing over the next 40 years and we build a Marvel, Pokemon, Sesame Street, just like people want to buy the first comic book of Batman or the rookie card of Michael Jordan, people will want it because the world's going digital. We're not going back. AI. AI is one of the biggest technologies that have ever been invented in the history of mankind. It's not taking your job and AI robots are not killing your children yet. And so, we're good. But people are demonizing AI because we always demonize new technology. When the tractor trailer was invented, most of the articles written in newspapers about it were negative because it was gonna take people out of jobs. Because almost everybody worked on farms. What it did was it gave us more time to do bigger jobs. AI is going to advance everyone's life here, let alone business. Just like a search engine is better than going to the dictionary or the yellow pages. 
Like there's a lot. How many people here in their life went to the yellow pages to look up something? Raise your hand. Everybody who just raised their hand, do we agree it's better to look it up on our phone? (laughs) That's AI. Right now we're emotional about it, job, because fear, we don't know it. What does it mean to me? But AI is gonna advance and do things for us. You know how nice it's gonna be to walk into your home, say, hey Alexa, I have four buddies coming over. One's lactose intolerant, two really like spicy food, my one friend really loves like sour beer. One of, one of us is really about seafood. Can you just order the best combo of meal at the lowest cost and send it to my home? That's how you're gonna order food in two years. That's a lot better than opening up Seamless, looking at like, and Seamless is a lot better than finding a menu in your drawer and calling the restaurant. Like think, AI is gonna make it, is gonna eliminate mundane things and make them faster so you have more time to spend with your family, think, innovate, so I'm very excited about AI. Do I believe there's some dangers? Of course I do. Like, of course there's things that will happen, but that's everything. When the knife was invented, danger came along with that. (laughs) No, really. Like, I I don't think people use history to understand the future. So that's kind of how I see that. I'm gonna just jump on deep fake because I want all of you who didn't raise your hand, which is the majority of this room, I would like you to Google it when you get home. Deep fake videos are videos where the AI makes the person say things that they didn't say. As a public figure, I believe within the next five years there will be more videos of me on the internet where I'm saying derogatory things using slurs that are inappropriate, making opinions of future apps that I don't believe, and that within 10 years, and remember, this is very powerful, over the last 100 years, the judge and the jury of our world has been video proof. Video, not the Supreme Court, not presidents, not religious leaders. Video is the judge and jury of our society. We have lived that way for 100 plus years. We are about to go into an era where it will be the opposite. Every person in here in 10 years will not believe a single video they see on the internet. Now, what does that mean? It means that most people don't know what an NFT actually is. Most people don't know what blockchain is. Most people don't understand cryptocurrency. The internet is on servers, I think we all know that. But those servers are controlled by companies, people, organizations. The blockchain is decentralized computers talking to each other, meaning nobody controls it, nobody can touch it. So when you put something on there and mint it, like an NFT, I can sell you a fake Michael Jordan rookie card. I can sell you a fake pair of Jordans. I can sell you a fake piece of art. Nobody will ever sell a NFT that is fake because you can't manipulate it. I believe that my content and every company in the world and every person in 10 years will first upload their video to the blockchain and then to the internet and that there will be a system that allows us to know if I actually uploaded it and at what time and when and that will become the checks and balances. I believe the blockchain is about to become one of the most important technologies in the world. Today everyone's just greed and cryptocurrency and Clinton. It's, it's my, just like, by the way, a lot of OGs in this room. When the internet first came out, we were all taught that it was just information. The information superhighway. Instead of going to the library, we'd go there. It's obviously evolved into a lot more and that's how I see that playing out. Nice to meet you, brother. Likewise. Hey, so we've been talking a lot about digital, you know, the, the new age. Why do you feel it was so important to, uh, to exhibit at a live event? Because it's real life. Because it's real life. Yeah, because I think people want to go like, or, and I'm about and. Right, people are like, oh, you gotta be all digital. I'm like, we live in real life. Right, um, books. When you intro, he's a five-time New York Times. Man, the amount of people, I have a new book coming out next year. Every time I promote it, I'll pro- my birthday's next week, I think. Yeah, next week I'll start promoting on my birthday, saying it's coming out next year. I will get 500 comments in social being like, yo, digital boy, why are you writing a book? And, and sometimes if I'm on a, in a mood, long flight, I'll jump in and reply to all of them and reply, because people read them. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not emotional about digital. I actually would be fine if there was no digital. 
I lived my whole life and grew up and went through high school without ever owning a computer or being on the internet. I know what it tastes like. I was cool, I liked it. So the reason I believe in events is when I'm at Comic Con with this booth or when I'm at the National, people are affected by it. People get to experience my characters. They get to take a selfie with all of them in the background because the real world exists. My problem is most people in business are over emotional about either the old world or the digital world. I don't give a shit. I just wanna grow. I don't think I get to decide. What most people don't realize is all of their opinions are based on their pocket. They don't want the digital world to keep growing because they're not comfortable with it and they're in the analog world. Most digital people don't understand the value of the real world because they're 100% digital and don't understand the real world. I think you need to understand both. Thank you. Plus, by the way, brother, I think they work together now. The reason I I believe in event marketing, crazy, but I think if you're gonna do an event, you need to film the whole fucking thing and chop up all the content and post it in social. I'm doing events for the content for social. My speaking career. Dustin, where are you at? There he is. Like, of course, I wanna build this relationship with biz devving, but part of the factor of me saying yes to this, because it's a lot more valuable for me to have just paid and not, like, right? Like, my time is valuable. I can make it work because he's filming this whole thing and one of my answers in the Q&A might be the clip that gets me two million views on LinkedIn and now it's worth it. I speak publicly, though I get a good handsome fee to speak, I still predominantly speak publicly at this point in my life where my time has become very valuable for the content. I I do podcasts predominantly to put on up and coming podcasters because I know if I do it, that will set them off and I want to give back to up and comers but also because I need the content. Bless you. So I think people should be doing more event marketing, not because I'm trying to be nice to you guys, because I actually believe it, and I think, but I think when they're building out their exhibits or their activation, they should be thinking about the post-production of the filming for their social. So you're almost executing the entire concept and strategy of your experiential for the visual effects of what will work on these platforms. You're reverse engineering the content distribution, not what you think will work as a sampling booth. You're like, okay, wait a minute, why don't I put a big penguin here? Because, or like, you know, we've all seen it. These restaurants that make, the the restaurant's built to look beautiful with all the rose petals in the background, so all the influencers take selfies in the back for exposure. You're actually making the real world built to entice people to create content to then distribute to the world to build awareness. Yes, sir. You should definitely call Metro, and if you, you and when you call Metro, if you use the code Gary V, it's ninety percent off. <laughs> Michael. Uh, yes. Hi, Gary. How are you? Very well. First and foremost, thank you for taking my hand before before you. Happy to do it, brother. I've been following since my high school. College professor showed me here. Thank you. I haven't turned back. Thank you, brother. So. I'm a businessman, I had the business education. I started my own DJing business, uh, so I do that as a passion project, but on my normal nine to five, I would just recently, within the past three weeks, went from a salesman to inside sales manager. Okay, okay. Selling liquid level gates and slight flow indicators um, for liquid applications, seeing things through pipes or levels on a boiler. Right, the cool shit. Yeah, <laughs> cool <laughs> stuff. Um, so, my question is, we just got bought out by a bigger company. We went from a small mom and pop company to yes. a company with 300 plus employees. Yes. So we went from a company with 20 employees to 320 employees. Different ballgame, yep. Different ballgame. People are used to how things run and operate, not only because of the fact that they've been working there for some of them their entire career, yes. given the owners of the company and that was bought, yes. but then they have the sales team, myself included, who was used to doing things a certain way, sure. and now it's not only being done, but now I have the authority to make changes to be able to help grow and increase the business and make that positive change for everybody. Okay. And can also help create a better work environment and a better culture that might have lacked prior. Interesting, okay. So, when it comes to making all these changes, in time, of course, of course. Uh, during this transitional period, how do you encourage people to embrace the positive growth strategies that I want to implement 
and make people have confidence in what you're doing and to not be so distraught about doing things the way they were. Because you're not the owner of the 300 person company, you have to approach this from a very specific angle. The quickest way to lose trust is not delivering on your word. So if you start telling all of us, if we're your entire team and you're like, guys, it's gonna be great and it's not gonna be as challenging or toxic and everything's rainbows and sunshine and our tech stack is remarkable compared to this and if any of those don't deliver, which you have no control over, you're dead. So the mistake a youngster like you makes in this world, in this kind of example, is you're optimistic, you're hungry, you're hopeful. But you have to be incredibly thoughtful of how you talk to your team. You have to talk to them in what we call in Vayner world, eyes wide open. What that means is you need to talk to them in truth. You need to say, hey listen, we know what was wrong in the last thing we were in. We don't know if it's gonna get any better here in this world, but at least we know what that was. I'm excited over the next six months to figure out what this new leadership is gonna do. I'm not gonna bullshit you, Joey, Chris, Heather. I'm gonna speak my truth to anyone who's willing to listen above me, but I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. Like, they're gonna feed me, and I'm gonna try to dissect what's real and what's not real. I may be wrong at times, but I promise you my intent for you is good to the best of my ability. The mistake that people play is they play hero ball when they don't have control. You have no control. You have some control, but the only person that has control in a business is the CEO or owner. And even in bigger companies, the CEO's really scared of the board, so they don't even have full control. So I I think you need to tread lightly on your promises, speak to your intent, and massively over-communicate. The biggest thing in my Chris, Joe, Heather talk would be like, you have my number or here's my number. If you go home at 7.30 next Thursday and pissed because someone from the new company pissed you off, text me, talk to me. You need to build an actual relationship with them, but do not over-promise. That is the killer that everybody walks into in this scenario. So historically, I've been always taught to, one, focus on the macro, not the micro, something you already touched on. But also, I've been taught historically from various mentors to resort to action. How would that play a role like this? I think what I just described is the ultimate action. The action is the real conversation. Got it? Thank Got you. it. Pleasure. <laughs> Joe? Hi, everybody. How are you, Joe? Good, man. Um, you know, one of the more fulfilling things that I've experienced through the years is when we make a mistake by trying and learn and grow from it. It's the best. And one of the most frustrating things I've experienced in business and life is do, failing the same way multiple times in a row. Yep. Until you finally get it. Yep. I'm just curious for you in, in your career, what was a moment where you taught yourself in that situation? It's a great question. <clears throat> to your point, brother, I think a real entrepreneur fails 98% of the time. I mean, I mean, I can't even, I, I could spend the rest of my life sitting in front of y'all telling you everything that hasn't worked out the way I thought it is because it happens every day. To your point, the real shit is, which one are you doing that's consistently a problem? The glaring, most obvious one. Because early on, I figured out, I got very lucky that, I, that the internet came along at the time it did, it did, and I was where I was at. I would have been a person that would have guessed about the next big thing in my early 20s because I hadn't calibrated yet how long it takes for innovation to happen. Notice how I said the metaverse is 14 years away. At 20, when, when I launched winelibrary.com in 97, I remember vividly saying to my friends in college, because I wasn't out of college yet, I'm like, by the year 2000, everybody's gonna buy wine on the internet. I didn't realize, because I'm such a yes person, I didn't realize all of you are no people. So I knew that that was, that I needed to learn timing. But I learned that one pretty quick. I made that timing mistake wrong a couple of times. I remember I bought an ad on luxury.com. I'll try to get louder. I bought an ad on luxury.com in 1998 for like 10,000 bucks, a lot of money. And I was like, this is gonna be huge. 
like I couldn't wait, I mean I barely, Christmas morning stuff, I barely slept the night before because I knew it was going live 9 a.m. Pacific time because they were a Silicon Valley company, so noon Jersey time. Had my morning, da da da, and I sat in front of the computer at 12.05 to see the orders coming in and nothing happened, I'm like okay, you know, 9 a.m. About an hour in, I'm like nothing, another hour, nothing. I called them, I'm like hey, do you have, like, cause I could see they had the right link. I'm like, am I, you know, it was really early internet. Like we were all figuring it out. And I realized I bought an ad on what seemed to be a big site, but it didn't have it, like I, I had to learn. So I learned being too early, but the one that I'm still working on, and it's funny based on the advice I just gave to Michael, cause it's really grounded in something real to me. The mistake I made consistently for 20 plus years was not delivering negative news to people in my company when they were underperforming because I didn't want to, I I viewed it as scaring them. The lowest point of my professional career was the day I had the aha when I was 42, 43 years old that I had spent 20 years trying to make everyone feel safe but that I built enough of a reputation that people knew they didn't fully know where they stood with me because I could see OJ on Friday and be like, OJ, have the best weekend, brother, love you. Keep up the good work and on Monday call him in and be like, we're gonna have to let you go. And he's like, yo, what the fuck? What happened on Friday, have the best weekend. And, I was, and what I did from 22 to 44 was I would blame OJ in that scenario. I'm like, bro, he should have known, like he knows he's been, and because I would sit on it forever. I'm like, he's been underperforming for two years. I would, I would put the blame on him and the reality is my number one favorite trait about myself normally is full accountability. I believe, how many people own their business? Raise your hand. Let me give you one that is just remarkable. Every single problem in your company is 100% your fault. You hired the person you're blaming and you can fire them. And so, brother, I'm so happy that I can talk in public that I've gone from a one out of 10 on this issue to a 5.2 and boy has my company and my life changed because of it and I'm excited to hopefully get to a seven or eight. I don't think I'll ever get to 10 because DNA is a powerful motherfucker. <laughs> but, but I could not deliver negative feedback and I branded it in a book and to my company, now we call it kind candor. And I don't care enough about money so I would carry people even though I was losing profit but I didn't realize I was actually creating fear and that killed me. Like it made me feel like my whole life's work was broken. So I've changed that and it's been huge. Kind candor and I know a lot of you who raise your hand struggle with this. Especially because some people are like your friend from high school, your cousin, somebody that was with you from day one but I'm telling you, you have to find kind candor. It also is a very good relationship advice. Like it's real, it's real and it doesn't come natural to me but it's real. And that's the thing I constantly made the same mistake on. Thank you, brother. You're good. They're going to turn you on now. Got you. What's up, man? Nice to meet you. What's your name? Marco. Marco. Yeah, nice to meet you. So I, I like your jacket, bro. Thanks, bro. Just got it, actually. It's fresh. Yeah, thank you. It's good. So I have a company, My Iron Man, with my business partner, Mike, over there. Uh, we do canvas design, branding, and packaging. Uh, we've been doing it for two years. This is our actually second year. Almost, I think tomorrow is our, our second year anniversary, which is awesome. It's awesome. Good for you. It's amazing. Uh, but the hardest thing I've ever done, but the most rewarding. Makes sense. Right? Uh, my question is not actually about my company. I'm very interested in artificial intelligence okay. in general. And you actually describe artificial intelligence in an interesting way before. You describe it as a tool. But the way I see it is there's never been a tool in the history of mankind that was able to operate itself. And with open, open AI, you know, talking about autonomous agents coming out next year. Yes. You know, potentially in the next couple of years, 50% of maybe white collar jobs technically could be done by AI. You know, and if that happens, what happens to our workforce? What happens it changes. on a global, it changes. On a global standpoint yeah. though? What does it mean to what, what do you think happened when the railroad was invented? 100%. But my point is, intelligence has never been commoditized. That's the one thing that... The question will be, I think it's a, you're, you're barking up the right tree. Yeah. You're right. We've nev- We've attacked hard labor, yes, right? Exactly. We're now attacking intelligence. Look, I am not putting, like my entire life is based on my perspectives 
and my ability, look what, I, look what we've been talking about. My, whatever knack I picked up with pattern recognition, DNA, luck of the draw, work I've put in, it's led me to be faster at observing. If I keep uploading questions and thoughts into AI, it will commoditize me. Then you have to find a new non-commoditizable thing. This is the thing that I'm optimistic about people. I think you're absolutely right. We are about to go into an era where things are about to be commoditized that have historically been the money maker, right? I mean, one could argue that beauty is going through that now. You know, like, sure, between filters, between plastic surgery, between Ozembic, like, you know, like, real talk, like, attractiveness is an advantage that continues to get more and more commoditized as the world has become infatuated with everyone wanting to look good. So this happens all the time. I agree, the size, the scale, the uniqueness of something that has been trillions of years in the making as value, and the speed in which we could see this. We could all wake up in six years and we're there. We're there next year. I, I don't think so, and I think you'll learn that based on what I just said about yeah. the metaverse. Like, yeah, sure. laws will come into, like, don't underestimate government, corporations, humans, fear. That's what will catch you on the one year. The tech is there. The tech is there for us to all live 24-7 in the metaverse. So I don't think real life will have it a year from today, but to your point, yes, can machines start to think better than us? We know that to be true. Does that scare the fuck out of people? Yes, but I promise you, if we were lucky enough to all be able to go dig up our great-great-grandmother and revive her through new technology, and she opened up her eyes, and calibrated the world we live in for a day, she'd be like, what the fuck is going on? (laughs) You know, the TV is a new invention. The TV, the airplane is a fairly new invention. I'm fascinated by people's inability to understand that innovation and technology will always advance. Like, literally, there are 90 year olds walking around on Earth that remember life, forget about pre-internet, pre-telephone, but like real, like you know what I mean? And so, I, what do I think? I think the human race has proven for a very long time that we'll, we, we will adjust. And do I believe that many people can be affected in the workforce? Of course I do, that's what always happens. The internet changed everything. And AI will do the same. Awesome, thank you so much. Cheers. Let me, let me say something real quick. Uh, I wanna get to the next question. Real quick, just an interlude. Everything we've been talking about since this is where the convo went, The big takeaway for all of you here is stop being a no person and become a maybe person. The fact that most people here have not spent 10 hours, 10 hours, which is a lot but a little in the scheme of your life. The fact that most people here have not spent 10 hours researching artificial intelligence is a mistake. It's a mistake. Like forget about like you're gonna retire in three years. Like this is gonna impact your life. If you plan on living, this is real. And like, I don't understand just saying no because one of your friends said something or you read one headline that like, and you're, you've become all of a sudden ideological about the workforce. But what really it is is you're hanging on to that because you're scared because you don't get it. You're not good with technology. You need to spend the 10 hours to understand this because now what will happen is you'll go from full defense to potential offense. Promise. Your time, when new things pop off, a couple of hours on Googling, you, you know, I have bad reading comprehension. Go to YouTube, it's the second biggest search engine, so you can listen to it or watch it. I didn't know what the fuck NFTs was, you know, 10 years ago, but I learned. Like, and I, I really, especially if you own it, one more time, I apologize, who owns a business? I don't understand. Especially if you're looking to not get completely taken out of business in the next five years. Like something could happen. I spoke at the national, this is insane, six months after, I, or maybe a year after I invested in Uber, I was the keynote speaker to the national black car and taxi industry in Washington DC. I was in a room of like 5,000 taxi and black cab owners and you can imagine the profile of this crowd. And I said Uber and they laughed. So like, we always think we have a moat when we don't. The only moat is leverage with the customer. Whoever's the closest and provides the most value to a customer wins. So if some cockamanian half-ass canvas or production facility builds a very simple front-facing website that uses AI correctly, 
to allow me to type in two sentences and automatically render me at the lowest cost a booth, even though you're in the physical business, I promise you that fucker's gonna be a problem for you. You understand? That's how this world works. So I wanna make sure everyone's locked into this morning back to, you know, what is it, a Wednesday morning level. You came here for a reason. I'm humbled by that. I want you to leave with action and real different strategy and perspective. And so please pay attention to this stuff. My man. Uh, Gary, my name is Shane. Nice to meet Shane, you. Pleasure. Well, thank you yourself and Phil and Ventro for you guys hosting. Thank you. Today. Uh, so I'm in the gym business. Yeah. Uh, I took over a small gym from a mentor of mine a couple years ago, my first year out of college. First year or two was all like personal training and like kind of just working with athletes, but recently partnered with some good people. We're looking to make it like a 24 7 model, self access key club. And But we're babies in the business industry, we're babies in content, just starting to try. We got like 250 followers on Instagram, but we're better than zero. Better than zero, exactly. So we're, we're starting to grow it. I would just ask maybe what would be some advice that you have for someone who's just starting off? What are some things maybe you've seen specific to the fitness industry that have helped scale? And then maybe just in general, eventually I'd like to kind of grow my own kind of personal brand, be able to down the road step away from the gym. There's just kind of the, grow on, online. Amazing. Everything I just heard, and as you can imagine, the, the, there may not be a more cliche stereotype than the fitness dude who built a fitness business on social and then decided to teach everybody how to build business and build a personal brand, you're like in my pocket. The answer to the question is you need to post 30 times a day on social media. But you have to be good at it. So what you need to do is what I just said about AI. You need to start Googling and YouTubing and podcasting and educate yourself on something I call SOC. Strategic organic content. Not just posting happy fucking Wednesday and hoping it works. Like why are you posting? Let me just pull it up right now, watch this. they like this. I'm going into my phone, I'm going into my content team WhatsApp and apologize, I need to run to a meeting so I'm gonna run out pretty quickly here so I apologize. I'm gonna scroll up, here it is. Here we go. This morning at 7.21 a.m. Mackenzie on my team said, good morning. I need you to post at 5.04 p.m. and 7.07 p.m. on Instagram. One needs to be a carousel, one needs to be a reel. This is called the science behind the art. I'm not out here posting randomly for ha ha ha. My social media strategy is not the following. (gasps) (laughs) All of yours is. I need you to understand the thumbnail, the first three seconds, what time you post, how many words, which platform, what's going on on LinkedIn carousels that's different than Facebook carousels, Facebook reels, what are broadcast channels. Do you know what the fuck is going on? This is now the television. And until you understand that, you are leaving money on the table, back to scaring them. This is how it works, brother. Right now, everyone, most likely, is just leaving double growth on the table. And then it becomes the thing that puts them out of business. And so, please take this serious. What you need to do, how many times a day do you post? I know it's nothing. How many? Apply once a day. Apply once, one post a day. And some days not even, right? Yeah, some days not even. Right. Even better about one a day and flooding the stories and stuff. Right. It's just Instagram. Think about where I am in my career and where I want to go and where you are. You want to grow. You're, you're day one. I shouldn't be the one in this relationship posting 55 times a day. You understand? Yeah. You will get customers on LinkedIn. You will get customers on YouTube Shorts. You will get customers on Snap Discovery. You will get customers on Pinterest. And you're in the best business. You're in the visual business. Take your shirt off and let's go. <laughs> I gotta go. Love you.